Welcome everybody to the um, last segment of our mentorship showcase 2023 and our mentees will talk about uh, their experiences with the mentorship and what they have learned during their mentorship program experience. Okay, let's uh, let's start a bit about um, beginner's problem. We all struggle with where to start when we are um, looking to do something new, something different from what we have been doing, uh, something new to learn, something uh, new career to explore, new technologies to explore, explore. We don't always know. The first, very first problem we all face is we don't always know what we are passionate about. Um, some of us do, some don't. We have to explore to find out what we would we enjoy doing and which open source project we want to contribute to, because there are many to choose from. And once we decide on a project, we struggle with how to get started, where to get started. Um, we find the communities to be daunting, um, intimidating, and then also code base looks very complex. Uh, at this point, when we do decide um, to the best place to start, we are looking to see where can we find resources for us to start learning a little bit before we go and approach the community, ask questions. And then um, these resources are important for us to be able to gain confidence to get some help. And then after that, we struggle with who can help us, who can ask answer questions for us. Once we figure these things out, the what and how and where and who, um, we are looking at the um, so next. So at the Linux Foundation, we understand uh, that uh, access to resources, access to learning paths is difficult and we provide them. You can explore um, your learning path and career paths at the LF. LF training site. Um, here is the link that you can go explore. Uh, take um, free classes. There are several free classes to take on there, training classes. And then you can go um, explore more learning at the LF um, live mentorship series. So this uh, mentor mentorship series is a 90 minute uh, webinar style, interactive style. Um, experts come teach um, these webinars on various tech topics. Once you figure out which project you want to apply, there's a host of projects hosted on uh, the LFX mentorship platform. So you can apply to one. And then the last, lastly, we um, connect graduates with uh, people looking for talent. And our graduates are trained by experts in their open source projects. I will leave you with this slide with all of the resources here. Um, and we do understand at the Linux Foundation that we recognize uh, that access to resources is a barrier to a lot of people. And we that is one of the reasons we provide all these resources uh, for people that wa are wanting to get started with open source. And empowering learning, you, you take ownership for your learning. What that means is that um, you have various uh, options to choose from. You can um, participate in part-time mentorships, full-time mentorships, uh, learn from watching the webinars and training resources and so on. So uh, you own your learning and you are empowered to do so. We continue to improve our programs. Um, we did a survey recently of all of our graduates from 2019 through 2021, asking them what they would like to see um, in terms of um, improvements to the mentorship programs, resources, webinars, and so on. So we have a report out. Please check that out. Uh, with that, I am going to hand off to Abdul Rafi uh, for his presentation. Take it away. Hello everyone, my name is Abdul Rafi, and today I am going to share my experience of LFX mentorship program. The 
little about me. I am pursuing a master's in computer application from Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi, India. I applied for Linux kernel bug fixing, uh, and the goals of this program were to introduce us to the Linux kernel internals, to understand the workflow of uh, Linux kernel development, and also to analyze and fix bugs. Uh, throughout this program, uh, I was mostly working on a bug in file system caching, and I faced several challenges. I uh, got stuck at several places, but nevertheless, I learned a lot, and I would like to share some of them. I got a good understanding of Linux kernel internals, I found out that it is divided into subsystems for ease, and uh, different sub subsystems are, for example, uh, memory management, and et cetera. And because I was going through a lot of C code, uh, it made me a better C programmer. I picked up a lot of good C programming practices. And I don't remember when I began to utilize system logs to directly troubleshoot errors. Secondly, I learned about static and dynamic uh, analysis of the programs. I learned to use uh, uh, tools like Sparse, Coxinel, and Syscaller. And one of the amazing skills I picked up was to utilize GDB to debug uh, remote processes. So basically, this is uh, one example on the slide, uh, a very simple one, where uh, Linux kernel is running in QMU virtual machine. And I use GDB to connect uh, to the host, uh, from the host uh, to the virtual machine to analyze Linux kernel uh, booting process. Uh, it did make me uh, better. Linux user, I found out um, about many tools that I utilize, that I do utilize today, uh, and that make me more efficient. And one of the problems that I faced was uh, the Linux kernel compilation process would abruptly close somehow. And that forced me to learn more about how my operating system, Ubuntu, uh, manages memory and manages processes. And I found out about something known as out of memory killer, which was actually the reason behind uh, the Linux kernel process being killed abruptly because uh, out of memory killer kills the process that is uh, that uses the most resources and also that that utilizes them for the most time. Uh, but anyhow, I tried to increase the swap and other solutions, but nevertheless, it didn't solve the issue. Lastly, I have to kill the out of memory killer and it worked, but maybe not a good solution. My mentor was Shura Khan and she had been really helpful and I'm really thankful that she gave me this opportunity that is of being mentored by her. Uh, she had answered a lot of our questions. She had been uh, guiding us on which books to choose and also she demonstrated us how Linux kernel hacking is done. And also uh, she gave us overall guidance on our career. Now, there were certain things during the program that uh, surprised me. Uh, one of them was the flexibility of the program. We were allowed to choose what we are comfortable with and we got the due support for that. Now, we weren't just solving uh, and fixing bugs, having discussions on just fixing bugs. Our mentor would discuss newer technologies that are being utilized in Linux kernel development. And open source community itself was a surprise to me because once I had a problem with Syscaller, I emailed it to, to the Google group of Syscaller. And the next day I got the reply. Later I realized that it, it was actually the maintainer who replied uh, with a solution have some aspirations uh, like I would want to be a regular contributor to Linux kernel and maybe maintain a project uh, an open source project and also I would love to speak in an open source summit uh, discussing some technology uh, or some cool tricks that are worth sharing at last uh, thank you very much for having me here for for uh, this event. And if anyone wants to reach me out, they can reach me out on my LinkedIn. I would be more than willing to help. And thank you.
Uh, so hey everyone, uh, I'm Ruchi Pakhle and LFX Mendy at Open Horizon for the Spring 2022 cohort. And today I would be talking about my uh, LFX mentorship ex experience. My talk is titled Roller Coaster Ride About My Journey. My talk would basically focus on two things: a quick overview followed by my work, uh, followed by my LFX mentorship experience. So a little about me. Uh, uh, I am currently a software engineering intern at Red Hat and a final year student at MGM's College of Engineering and Technology. You can reach out to me. Uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter or on my GitHub. Uh, okay, so uh, my talk would basically be focusing upon two things: a quick overview followed by my LFX mentorship experience. So, firstly, why why I chose Open Horizon. So I always wanted to uh, start learning DevOps and cloud native technologies, but I was like procrastinating and, uh, and like, I did not know how to start ahead. And like uh, there uh, I was like, uh, I was uh, just scrolling LinkedIn on, uh, on some day and I found out that, okay, th there are some opportunity for LFX cohorts at Open Horizon. And since I was already active contributing to it, I thought, okay, it's a good chance for me to see, uh, like, uh, you know, try my hands on, on cloud native technologies and DevOps and see like if I'm selected or not. Uh, so that's how I applied to Open Horizon and then I uh, got selected into it and I was good to go with it. Then, uh, then it is like the uh, edge computing, like uh, le like the con let's talk about the concept of edge computing. So edge computing is an emerging uh, computing paradigm that refers to a range of networks and devices at or near the user or uh, like uh, locating close to the origin. So edge is about processing data closer to where it's being generated, enabling processing at more incredible speeds and volumes leading to greater action uh, led results in real time rather than processing data uh, from the centralized database servers. So that, uh, so that is about edge computing basically. And the, uh, so let's talk about what is Open Horizon and what, uh, what it consists of. So Open Horizon consists of management hub where administrative operations are centralized, edge device agent combined with container runtime where all the uh, like operations of software engineering cycle uh, happens over here. And then we have edge cluster agent combined with OCP cube platform. So the management hub consists of open horizon and cube, uh, Cuban like management hub and the Kubernetes. So uh, the, in, uh, in the Kubernetes, uh, we have the OCP cube platform and in the management hub, we have edge device, edge cluster getaway and network edge where the, uh, like the networks for edge computing happens or the, uh, like it, it is basically edge for regional and local offices and uh, it is hosted on Kubernetes. Uh, so the main components, let's talk about the main components of Open Horizon. So uh, it has a edge location called as the Open Horizon agent. So in Open Horizon agent, we have devices and cluster. So devices, for devices, we use Docker as a device. And for cluster, we use Kubernetes cluster to host the, uh, like, uh, to host our containers on it. So the node agent, the node agent consists of register node, negotiate agreements, model synchronization, and monitor agreement conditions. So again, like, uh, it has centralized public or private cloud or on-premises. So what happens is Open Horizon agent synchronizes with Open Horizon Management Hub and it performs operations on a wide basis. It has like container registry, switchboard, exchange, agreement board, uh, board model manager, secure device, or onboard secrets manager and stuff. So switchboard and exchange is hosted on system state. Agreement board and model manager are uh, based on um, in model repository and service de device onboard secrets manager are based in the vault of the open horizon. Next, uh, so the next is, uh, let's talk about my mentorship experience. So uh, like, 
there there were few things where i uh, where like you know uh, i thought like okay should i give up or like uh, are things not working and stuff so uh, like my mentorship experience uh, started with nowhere knowing how to uh, like you know uh, like how things happen in the example repository of open horizon how things takes place so uh, i started with learning go then uh, i uh, like the management hub installation took uh, took around a month of a time and it was very hectic because i had a windows laptop and the systems were failing and stuff but like uh, i coordinated with my mentor and uh, like the things uh, were working out hopefully and then i uh, learned uh, what is edge computing what is stuff i constantly uh, was performing my tasks uh, like hosting meetings with my uh, mentor and stuff so it was a great experience for sure then key takeaways my key take uh, my key uh, takeaways were start small if needed like you know uh, there like it is not like that that you know you need to uh, like know every and each thing start small take a little steps take baby steps first take initiative of your work take ownership of what you are doing and what you are bringing to the table seek feedback from your mentors on a constant basis on a weekly basis or like uh within two weeks or stuff uh like go ahead with what works for you and like uh, you have to be resilient when, uh, when things are not working in your favor because uh, resilience uh is very important uh in like uh in this programs and like uh, being resilient and patient uh, like you know opens uh, new uh, doors or opens uh, the solutions to your problems basically then uh, like like be active in the community harness the community be community driven because i am a huge community person and like everything i have done in open source is because of uh, my activeness in community my interactions with people uh, be like being active in uh, on different uh, social media platforms like linkedin twitter you get to know very much uh, new things from uh, like being active in you know uh this platforms being active in community basically because you network with like minded people you know like what is there out there you know what people are doing there uh, who is better than you and how you can be better uh, that better than yourself so it is like a healthy competition with yourself where uh, you know if you are present in the community you know like uh, you know the uh, path you like you are not dependent on your college and stuff basically and lastly maintain a balance of everything it's not that you are just uh, spending time on uh, social media platforms and stuff so it, uh, you have to maintain a balance so yeah thank you for listening Hello, I am Shreya Sharma. I am a senior year CSE student from MIT, India, and I was a mentee at Elisa Medical Devices Working Group under the Linux Foundation Mentorship Program. So, Elisa is short for Enabling Linux in Safety Applications. It is a project where kernel developers and system experts, safety experts, work together to analyze. Uh, safety critical applications deployed on linux like medical devices and uh, automotive devices uh, so elisa members uh, define and maintain a common set of elements processes and tools that can be incorporated into specific linux based uh, safety critical systems uh, elisa uh, members uh, also work with uh, certification authorities to uh, explore various applications of linux in safety critical systems so open aps is open source artificial pancreas system uh, it is used by uh, patients having type 1 diabetes and it is designed to adjust uh, an insulin pumps uh, insulin delivery to keep blood glucose in a safe range it is uh, deployed on a raspberry pi it uses raspberry pi so about my project uh, i was uh, as a mentee i was required to use Uh, Linux kernel tracing and S trace uh, to discover the Linux kernel subsystems used by Open APS. Uh, meaning, I had to uh, and uh, I had to see how Open APS workloads uh, uh, interact with the kernel. So uh, the 
So it is very necessary to uh, see how these applications interact with the kernel because any failure in such cases can damage the device and also uh, and can also lead to loss of life. So uh, ELISA has several working groups with it for it, uh, like medical, automotive, and aerospace. And I was working uh, at the medical devices working group where we were doing analysis on open APS. So I was also required to write a blog or white paper on my findings, uh, which would aid ELISA medical devices working group to focus on the subsystem system calls and modules that make up the footprint for safety. So I will talk a bit about system calls now. So uh, uh, in order to, so for any user space application, if it wants to access the hardware resources, then it has to issue system calls to the kernel. Uh, user space applications can't direct, uh, directly uh, access the uh, hardware resources. They have to first issue system calls, then the kernel uh, services those requests. So broadly speaking, there are two modes in an operating system. The first is user mode. Uh, it has very limited control over the hardware. And in order to use any system resources, it has to issue system calls. Uh, the second is kernel mode. It has full control over the hardware and it can execute any instruction and it can access any memory location. So what are the advantages of this design? So system calls allow kernel to carefully expose key pieces, key pieces of certain functionality to user programs. So as an example, if some file that is only accessible to the only uh, allowed to use a uh, root user to use it. And if some other user uh, can directly uh, read that file uh, by directly accessing that uh, the disk, then there is no point of having that rule. So it is very important for user space applications to have very really limited control over the hardware. Uh, system calls provide us an interface by which uh, the hardware can be accessed in a very uh, secure and safe manner. And secondly, it uh, results in less coupling between the user space applications and operating systems. So uh, application designers don't have to design their applications, keeping in mind the uh, hardware, different uh, hardware architectures. So I will be uh, discussing some tools now that I used during my project. Uh, first was s uh, It enables us to keep track of all the system calls made by a process. Uh, so it is very useful for understanding what exactly is happening behind the scene. And we used it at Elisa to discover the system resources uh, that are used uh, by a workload when it runs on Linux. So it is very easy to use it. Uh, you have to use s command followed by the command uh, that you want to trace. So here I have used ls, and these are all the system calls made by the ls command. So here you can see the parameters also that are passed to every system call. So, uh, uh, so uh, this way we can see what exactly is happening behind the scene. We can uh, troubleshoot various issues, and uh, uh, we can uh, also see that on which files a process de depends or which files the process uh, uses for its execution. So overall, it is a very useful command. So uh, we can also use the hyphen C parameter with S trace to generate a detailed report of all the system calls made, uh, the time they took and uh, their frequency uh, to get the overall, uh, uh, to, do the, to get a very really high level overview of uh, what is happening behind the scene. So next tool that I used for C scope. So it is a command line tool, which is used for browsing C, C++ or Java code bases. And it is very useful for understanding a new code base and for uh, uh, exploring the uh, flow of execution of various functions. So I used it in my project to find which system calls belong to which subsystem. Uh, this way we can find the kernel systems used by and used by a process when it is executed. So uh, to initialize the C scope database uh, on the kernel code base, so we have to run the following commands. So this is how the C scope console looks. 
uh, at the bottom, we enter the queries uh, we want to execute and the output uh, appears at the upper half of the screen. So system calls are defined in the Linux kernel using the syscall defined macro uh, in their subsystem directory. So we can search for this pattern in the uh, uh, code base of Linux, and then uh, we can uh, get the subsystems uh, to which they belong. So here is, uh, I have executed this. So here we can see various system calls of the memory management subsystem. Uh, I search for this pattern. And uh, here we can see hundreds of system calls like this uh, that uh, that can be found in their subsystems uh, in the under the file column. So this way we can find the subsystems uh, to which uh, each system call lies. So uh, during my mentorship program, I analyzed some workloads under S trace to see how they interact with the kernel. I generated one of the workloads using stress ng. Stress ng is used for performing stress testing on the kernel. Uh, it aims to test the robustness of the kernel under very extreme real world conditions. Uh, it, it is basically used for putting more load on the server. It uh, attempts to crash the kernels by exercising various uh, kernel subsystems like CPU, CPU cache, et cetera. So this is how the NetDev uh, stressor works. Uh, here uh, we can see it has uh, issued various IO control commands on the network de devices. So this is how the output looks uh, when we perform stress testing on uh, network devices. And uh, here I executed this command under S trace. So these are all the system calls uh, generated by this workload. And uh, I mapped, I used Cscope to map these system calls with their subsystems. So these are all the system calls uh, with their subsystem uh, in which they lie. So there are uh, system calls from the file system, subsystem, and memory management and signal and process management and network and time and futex. So uh, this way, S3 is a very useful tool by which we can discover the system resources and use by a workload. Uh, understanding the path that a workload is taking in the kernel, understanding the system resources uh, it is using is very important is important to avoid regressions and for a safety analysis. Uh, and uh, this way we can do a high level uh, analysis of the kernel and identify the components for safety. So I wrote a detailed white paper on the best practices for tracing a workload, uh, which is available on Elisa GitHub. So uh, this work paper can also help other Elisa working groups in their analysis. So now I would like to thank uh, my mentors to Shua Ma'am and Milan sir for believing in me and for their stimulating suggestions and unending support. I am also very grateful to all the members of the medical devices working group to Kate ma'am to Nicole ma'am to Jason sir and Jeffro sir for their constant guidance and support and uh, I would also like to thank Linux Foundation for providing me with this platform. So my overall mentorship experience was very nice. Uh, my mentors were very experienced, friendly and motivating. I learned a lot from them and, the, and through the tasks they assigned to me. Uh, and I learned a lot about the Linux kernel during this program. And my uh, uh, and Elisa community also was very nice, was very welcoming. Uh, their member, its members were uh, always ready to help me whenever I needed any help. And uh, uh, and uh, and I got to learn very powerful tracing tools like uh, S trace, F trace, C scope, and Perf. And uh, medical devices working group members used to work on. SGP analysis for analyzing the safety of open APS. And I learned a lot from the discussions. So, uh, and uh, during this time, I realized that uh, uh, kernel uh, development is what excites me the most as it uh, allows me to work at very low level and overall, it, it, and knowing such things, it helps me to become a better programmer. 
So, and I also uh, uh, gave my first presentation at a con technical conference at LSA Summit where I presented my uh, work, my white paper. And uh, I have also compiled a list of useful resources on my Medium blog here. So if you are uh, interested in learning about the Linux kernel, then uh, you can try out these resources. So uh, my future plans are that I will learn more about the Linux kernel, uh, contribute to it, and uh, pursue a career in it. And uh, doing this mentorship made me realize the immense potentialities of the Linux kernel, uh, about which I was not aware before. So it was overall a very uh, life-changing experience for me. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Mayan Kumar and today I'll, I will be talking about my experience building the VS Code extension with cross-platform support for NARCs. Moving on, I would like to give you a brief introduction about me. I am a final year student at VIT Vellore and I am very passionate about cloud and cloud security. It's truly amazing to see the, the kind of innovation that is taking place in this field. During my research and my learnings, I, I came to know about what is confidential computing and NLARCs. To give you a brief understanding of what is confidential computing, confi confidential computing allows you to make secure environments where, uh, where you can run a program. Now, as your program executes, the data that it uses for computation, even that, uh, that data remains encrypted in memory as well as while it is being processed by the CPU. Now, this is something great about confidential computing. Anox is a tool that, that facilitates this thing. Anox is a, is a framework that allows, you, that allows you to run Bosom applications inside these secure enclaves. Anox allows you to run, uh, run these applications irrespective of the, uh, the platform that you are using, be it Intel SGX or AMD SEV. That's something great about Anox. Now, talking a little bit, bit more about what is WASM. WASM is a binary file format. Now, there is a wide range of languages that it can be compiled to as a WASM binary. Now, this is something great. This allows uh, the applications to be portable and very secure as these applications, when, when they are being executed, are sandboxed in an environment. I truly believe WebAssembly can be the next uh, wave of innovation and is leading the next wave of innovation in the uh, cloud native uh, in the field of cloud native. Now, knowing all of this, I got to be a part of Confidential Computing Fellowship. This was truly a life changing experience for me. Moving on, I would really like to thank the superheroes of my journey. Uh, my mentor Nick Vidal was really supportive and helped me out with everything and anything that I needed at any point in time. It was really, really supportive of him, him to, uh, to guide me and, and motivate me at every point when we had our discussions design, discussing about design, the design challenges and the features that we are building and how it's gonna make uh, an impact on the community around Anarx. I would also like to thank the entire team of Anarx who were really supportive and they were very active in giving their feedback and really helped me out to complete my milestones and coming up uh, coming up uh, with, pro with a project that is really going to be useful for the developers uh, that who are going to be using uh, for uh, using NRX for the development. Moving on, I would like to discuss about my work. Uh, I was building a VS Code extension for NRX from ground up. Now it's it's a really great tool. It has a lot of features right now, uh, and it is still in a, uh, still in development. So many more features are going to be built into it. So right now. Uh, the extension can validate an Toml, which is a configuration file. It also notifies you of, of the latest Anox releases. So uh, if you have an outdated version of Anox on your machine, it's gonna pop. Uh, it's gonna give you a pop up, and you can update your local uh, local Anox instance straight from that side. You can also install Anox using the extension uh, if you do not have Anox installed on your machine. 
you uh, you can run wasm workloads with an ARCs. All this while having a very, very targeted error management system. So any at any point when you face an error, the error message is going to be specific, and they're also going to give you a link to the documentation which you can go through and read and uh, uh, fix uh, fix and recover from any point of failure which you have encountered. Now talking a little about drawbridge and codex support that I have built into the Enux. Now drawbridge could be take, uh, taken as an equivalent for uh, Docker Hub. Now sim similar to Docker Hub where you host Docker images, uh, with drawbridge you can host uh, host uh, host some binary applications which could be pulled on any platform and Enux can run those uh, images. Now, uh, what is Codex? Codex can be taken and taken as an example hub. So anyone from a new beginner to an experienced developer can pull the code and build on top of that uh, code be, uh, of that code example code, and uh, he can build some amazing applications there. Now, I want to talk about some of the challenges that we encountered by building this extension. So one of the features of Anax is that it is uh, it has a wide range of support and it is rapidly evolving and changing. Another thing uh, that we wanted to keep is that the errors of the validation checks of these configuration files that we have, um, those errors have to be very humanized and they are very readable and understandable by a new user. So what we did is that to accommodate the rapidly changing uh, uh, configurations and rapidly evolving uh, state of technology, we uh, what we do is like when we load the configuration into uh, into the application, we have a generic interface uh, which validates uh, the the loaded configuration, which is then stored as a JSON, uh, and then JSON is validated uh, um, by a JSON schema. Now, this JSON schema, um, uh, can, we, we can build a feature a feature around this uh, VS Code extension where the JSON schema could be pulled from the cloud, and we do not have to make a release every time a new uh, new change is being made to the configuration with the Enux, uh, the Enux binary. So even without updating the extension, every time a new change, uh, uh, new change is brought about in the configurations, we do not need to update the extension as well. Uh, another thing is that we use uh, community libraries and uh, uh, to humanize these errors when we do validation checks so that the errors are very simple to understand. Uh, like if you have a regex error, you can, it can point it out. Uh, and similarly, if you have used a field or parameter which is not valid for a particular attribute, you, you're gonna be notified about it. You use the port range out of, uh, like out of the usual 16-bit 60, 60, 16 uh, port numbers, uh, you will be notified of that error as well. Similarly, there are, the, there are the checks for uh, the, address that, it, that uh, the application binds to, and similarly, there are many more validation checks. Now, talking about another challenge that we faced was releasing uh, release notifications. We did not have, no at the time we were building it, we did not, we did not have a, a specific backend that uh, fetches and uh, like pushes out release notifications and with the assets that are, uh, the, the assets or the binary that uh, have to be released with a notification. We had to depend for the GitHub uh, API itself. So we made a ge very generic interface so that we could pu pull the latest uh, releases from the GitHub API and then match between our, uh, the version installed on a local, local system and the latest release and uh, give him a notification and uh, without needing, uh, uh, doing this all without needing a separate backend service. So this is uh, another challenge that we had to encounter. Uh, another challenge that we had was supporting multiple operating system for update and installation of an ARX. Now, uh, when we update and, or and install an ARX, there are multiple dependencies that we have to check for. Now, there are many, many times these different dependencies behave differently on different platforms, for example, on uh, Darwin and on Linux. So we have to do rigorous testing so that uh, we can ch we check across all platforms that, okay, everything is working fine. So these were, this was another challenge that we had to face. Now talking a little about what were the takeaways from my experience, I learned to design a tool or a software with extensibility in mind. I've worked in a structured and, uh, in a structured and established uh, milestones, worked with structured and established milestones. So I was able to finish all, all the work and set timelines 
and which was a, a great experience for me because it provided me uh, the skills of uh, like provided me to work on my skills on uh, of time management. Uh, I got to participate in discussions on complex design challenges that the team was facing while building an ARCS. So it was a great learning experience for me there. I got like the tool that I have made will be helping so many developers. I'm really gonna be in rejo rejoicing it as the, the project grows and uh, the impact it makes on the, the, on the work of the developers. Another takeaway was that my mentor and, and the NARC team were really amazed by my, by my work, which was a huge confidence booster for me. My work, uh, you know, my work was also featured in Azure plus Intel Confidential Computing Webinar, which has over 1,000 K subscribers, which was which is really amazing for me. Now, in the end, I would like to talk about uh, the vision I have for the work I will be doing and the direction I want uh, my efforts to be in. My uh, my vision is to create create a safe internet, safe uh, safe environment for everyone, whoever uses the internet where the security is built into the tools and in everything that we use out of the box. And someone does not have to be a security expert or a computer genius to figure out and enable settings uh, for keeping him safe on the internet. Everything works out of the box. Everyone is safe on the internet. All my efforts I want uh, to be in making that scenario possible for everyone. Uh, I think that a lot of progress has been made in this in this field and I think I'm going to be working towards contributing this to this cause more. Now with this I come to the end of my presentation. I'm looking for my next adventure. If you have, a, if you want to connect with me, you can connect me on these credentials. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Gautam Menghani and I will be talking about the summer that I spent working on the Linux kernel as a part of the Linux kernel mentorship program. I would like to start uh, by briefly introducing myself. I'm currently working as a Linux kernel developer. Uh, my main areas of interest have always been operating systems and low level programming in general. Also, I have contributed to uh, multiple open source projects and consequently, I am I'm a firm believer in the uh, open source philosophy and I think that it is the best way to uh, build software. Now let's start with understanding what the Linux kernel is. So uh, Linux is a kernel, which means that uh, it is a heart of an operating system and it is crucial to uh, the working of an operating system. The Linux kernel can be found everywhere in right from smartphones to servers to automobiles and smart devices, etc. We can uh, safely say that um, Linux is running the world. Now, what if somebody wants to contribute to the Linux kernel? This is where the kernel mentorship programs, uh, kernel mentorship program comes into picture. Uh, I was a part of the um, Linux kernel mentorship program, which is an initiative uh, taken up by uh, Linux Foundation to uh, help people get into Linux kernel development. So going into the program, I had a few key objectives in mind. Uh, the first thing is that I wanted to learn more about the Linux kernel internals. So how do areas like memory management, networking, and uh, you know the architecture specific code works? I also wanted to uh, fix bugs in the Linux kernel and help make it uh, more stable and also contribute uh, at least five batches along the way. Now I would like to talk about what I worked on. The first and foremost thing that every Linux kernel developer does is building the Linux kernel source code with different configuration options. This is important as Linux kernel has a lot of features and not all the features are useful all the time in every situation. Now on the flip side, this also means that uh, there are some bugs that are uh, visible, that are reproducible only on certain configuration options and that is why uh, when a new um, version of Linux comes out, it is important to test it with different configurations to make sure that it does not have any regressions. Also, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, testing and debugging techniques available on the Linux kernel. One of the most common technique is using uh, static and dynamic analysis tools to discover bugs. Uh, I used a 
static analysis tool called uh, Clang Scan to find and fix three warnings in the uh, kernel code base. I also use the uh, dynamic analysis mechanisms like GDB and the F trace event tracing mechanism to uh, monitor the runtime behavior of the kernel and understand the program flow. Uh, I, uh, during my mentorship program, I mainly contributed to uh, the kernel self tests and MASM. Uh, so kernel self-test is a test suite that is used to test kernel from uh, user space. Uh, the advantage of this is that we, we get to uh, test the kernel specific code as well as the system call boundary. So this is more like an integration uh, integration test suite. Uh, in, in the in case of test, uh, sorry, uh, in, in case of test, I contributed to the data access monitoring tests. Specifically, I added a secure boot check and also the huge page access test. I also worked on refactoring some of the tests in the net networking and the seccomp section of the cell test. I also contributed to Masim, which is a tool that, which is a, a artificial memory workload generator that is used to test the memory, memory systems. Uh, Masim earlier did not have support for using huge pages and I added support for uh, uh, so that it can use uh, huge pages for its workloads. Now, what did I learn from my mentorship experience? Uh, I understood, I learned and understood the entire kernel development process right from the mailing lists to the thorough coding uh, standards. Uh, that are there in the Linux kernel and also uh, the do's and don'ts of interacting with the community. Also, personally for me, uh, contributing to the Linux kernel uh, re-emphasize the importance of documentation as documentation is used by everybody right from the mentees and interns to the maintainers and also uh, the users of the uh, product. Uh, next, I would like to talk about my collaboration with my awesome mentors. Uh, my mentors during the program were Shua Khan and Pavel Skripkin. Uh, so Shua is the maintainer for the self-test suite, the USB over IP driver, and also the USB IP and CPU power tools. Uh, Pavel has been contributing to the Linux kernel since 2021 and has and is also a reviewer for uh, one of the Wi-Fi drivers. So uh, throughout the program, our mentors conducted office hours twice a week to make sure that everybody was progressing and um, not stuck on anything. Uh, during the uh, office hours, the technical discussions that we had on various topics across the kernel were invaluable. Also, uh, our mentors guided us on maintaining a high level of discourse with the community so that we can effectively contribute to the community. And also, uh, during the uh, during our office hours, uh, Shua gave us a lot of um, uh, invaluable career advice, which has been which has proved uh, fruitful for me. Uh, now, my journey in the Linux kernel was not without roadblocks. Uh, the biggest roadblock that I faced was that I failed to make it into uh, the Linux kernel mentorship program spring of 2022. Uh, also, when I uh, started working on the Linux kernel, I initially struggled a lot when fixing sysbot bugs as they are quite uh, varied in nature. Uh, they can be anything right from race conditions to uh, uh, lack of uh, safety checks to logic bugs. And also, I constantly doubted myself whether I am good enough for this. Nevertheless, I'm happy that I continued to learn and persevere and finally I could uh, overcome the roadblocks that I faced. Uh, next, I would like to talk about my uh, aspirations as a kernel developer. Uh, one of my main objectives as a kernel developer is to help build the next generation of technology. Uh, also, I would uh, like to help uh, to uh, build more features into the Linux kernel and also make it more stable so that it can be used in almost all the workloads. Also, I would like to uh, uh, give back to the community as I have learned everything that I have learned from the community itself. So I would like to give back to the community by uh, helping build tools, contributing to uh, different mechanisms that we have, and also uh, by writing blog posts and giving talks about and share my knowledge along the way. Finally, I would like to uh, give some advice to uh, future mentees. Uh, the most important advice uh, whenever working on anything, uh, when, whenever working on a complex project, 
like a Linux kernel is to remember that persistence is key. So in order to make meaningful contributions to anything significant, it is important to be persistent at it and uh, keep on continuously learning about it. Uh, another thing that another point that I feel is important is that while working with uh, complex bugs, uh, it is easy to get stuck and demotivated. So it is. So I feel it can be very helpful if uh, a person uh, interleaves the complex bugs with easy to medium level fixes, so that they can uh, they can keep their motivation going. And uh, and finally, it is important to have fun along the way. Uh, let curiosity be your guide, and you will end up uh, making meaningful impact. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to my talk. Uh, I, uh, if anybody wants to uh, connect with me, we, uh, we can connect on LinkedIn. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, respective to your time zones. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about learning from and giving back to the communities. Now, in this presentation, we will uh, explore the importance of the open source communities, the benefits of contributing to the open source projects, and ways to give back to the community, right? so. A uh, quick short introduction of myself. I am a student uh, pursuing bachelor's in computer and in my final year. And apart from academics, I am a, a software quality engineering intern at Red Hat. And yes, uh, I have also volunteered Kubernetes release team as a shadow uh, four times, like two times in docs team and two times in CI signal. And previously I have worked as a GSOC mentee with Captain organization. And yes, I'm here right now speaking because I was a LFX mentee back in spring 2022 uh, with CNCF. So yes, let's start. Like uh, I want to share, uh, I would like to start with the importance of the community, right? So open source communities are an integral part of the software development industry, which drives the innovation and provides access to the high quality software for everyone. Now these communities are built around some principle, like that software should be freely accessible to all, with the ability for anyone to contribute, modify, and distribute the software. Communities also provide a way for developers to learn and grow their skills, right? So uh, everybody uh, would like to know the benefits to step into the open source community. So the benefits of contributing to open source projects are numerous, right? So for one, participating in open source communities, allows developers to learn new skills and technologies. Now, this can include learning a new programming language, working with the new tools, or gaining experience with different development process. Uh, additionally, contributing to open source projects can help developers build a portfolio of work that can be used to demonstrate their skills and abilities to the potential employers, right? Now, another benefit is the opportunity to collaborate with other developers from around the world. Now, this can include working on a project with other developers, providing feedback and suggestions, or mentoring others in the community. Now, let me share my case. Like while I was applying to the LFX mentorship, uh, I applied with the Linux kernel and the CNCF one. So, uh, it's a good opportunity for me. Like I got selected for both of them, but uh, according to the rules, I can only opt for one. So I need to drop this Linux kernel, Linux kernel one, but uh, it gives me a much and a bunch of learning uh, related to the open APS system, which I was totally unaware about it before 
applying to the mentorship program so yes now uh, everybody ask me like i get a lot of dms regarding how can you get involved in open source projects benefits are the other thing but the first thing is you need to step into the open source projects right so i would like to say you like uh, first of all identify your interest in the skills from the wide uh, availability of the tech stack right you need to identify your interest and skills now there are many ways after you um, choose your skills right to find the open source projects that align with your interest and skills now one way is to search for the open source projects on the platform like github uh you can do it by searching for specific keywords or tags now additionally you can also find the projects through online communities and forums such as the google summer of code uh, site is the big uh, big big platform to uh, have a look at it and yes in recent years like uh, the linux foundation has expanded its support programs through events training and certification as well as the open source projects like the linux foundation projects uh, hosted um, many other also like uh, linux kernel project hyperledger kubernetes or say any cncf uh, sub project and many others now right after you have found your project that you are interested in contributing to it's important to follow the best practices for collaborating and communicating within the community and maintain consistency now this includes reading the project's documentation and guidelines as well as being respectful and professional when communicating with other members of the community now after you have done your part right it's important that you are playing your role in the community as a mentor now everybody invested their time in you to train you now it's your time to mentor others to uh, follow the chain of uh, learning and mentoring others so as you contribute uh, to the projects now it's important to give back to the community in return you need to uh, this can include uh, like mentoring others in the community uh, by uh, organizing some talks or some meetups and the other way can be contributing to documentation like you know that um, without documentation you can't learn any new project everybody starts with a documentation by following the docu the documented instructions right um then the other way can be the financially supporting projects and maintainers like through sponsorships uh, many projects rely on donations and sponsorships to fund their development and maintenance right now uh, while giving back to community principle i have received once like from a mentor like um, while we was uh, we were talking randomly he uh, i got to know that like it it's hard time sometimes to convince the senior people in the company to contribute in mentoring right some uh, there is some work to do here so i will highly encourage you like after you are you are trained at a level at some level you, please be open to mentor the newbies in the community right so people don't know like what's the hidden benefit of giving back to oss right now a famous quote from the frank nagle uh, he is a assistant professor at the harvard business school says that like firms that allow their software programmers to give back to the open source community on a company time gain benefits right so it's being said that like paying employees to contribute to such software boost the company's productivity from using the software by as much as 100% now let's take a scenario right like when a program or engineer runs into a problem or an opportunity to improve the linux kernel code now what they generally suggest is a change 
to the Linux maintainer. Now, a maintainer is an experienced user who provides the feedback and guidance on making the proposed improvement, right? So now through this collaborative process, the less experienced contributor gains a deeper understanding of the system structure and functions. Now, building an a building on existing literature that has shown the value of learning by doing and that is the important thing right now many people argue that learning by contributing principle is also a powerful source of the competitive advantage for companies in certain circumstances now with that i would uh, i have come to an end with with my presentation and to conclude i encourage you to take the time to find open source projects that align with your interest and get involved in the open source community i feel free to ping me on the socials my username is same throughout all and yes thank you so much for joining and listening to me Hi, my name is Abdul Badud and I am giving, I will be giving my talk uh, on the uh, LFX Mentorship Showcase. So I will be talking about my project and uh, then I will share my experience throughout this mentorship. So uh, a little bit about my introduction. I am from Pakistan. I am a recent electrical engineering graduate from uh, UET Lahore and uh, ha have been working as a hardware engineer at Tenex Engineers. And uh, uh, my, my core areas of interest are computer architecture, digital systems, and uh, VLSI. So, so the, this mentorship project was offered by this five international in spring 2022 uh, Linux Foundation Mentorship Program. And the title of the project is the RIS-5 Compressed Exchange Instructions for Self. I was, I, uh, I was mentored by uh, Olaf Kingran, who is uh, a senior digital design engineer at Camcom, also the, uh, the director and the co-founder of Fossey Foundation. So, uh, Let's get started with the project. We, I will be explaining uh, each word from this title and uh, give you the overview about uh, what, what uh, was intended and what I have done uh, in this mentorship project. So uh, many of you uh, <clears throat> have probably heard about the RISC-5. RISC-5 is uh, the fastest growing ISA, which is open source, open standard, and royalty free. And uh, it, it has a modular architecture and uh, it will, the base ISA is mandatory and uh, it has many optional extensions such as vector extension, floating point and so on. Many, many optional extensions and it, it keeps on developing. So uh, we will be talking about the compressed extension of the RIS-5. So uh, RIS-5 compressed extension is for the deeply for for the deeply embedded applications uh, where where we have we are limited by the size of the memory um, so what it does is it compresses the RIS-5 uh, instructions binary instructions in uh, 32 uh, by default the binary instructions are 32 bit of size but uh, those instructions that can be compressed will be compressed by the compiler uh, into the 16 bit formatting and uh, and hence the instruction size is, will be is reduced by half uh, so it is used for like very um, deeply embedded applications uh, where where uh, our area is at premium and uh, we are limited by the size of the memory 
and uh, the next thing is the serve serve is a RIS 5 uh, bit serial cpu uh, this has been developed by my mentor uh, all of in 2018 uh, so it uh, it is a award winning cpu uh, um, open source uh, world smallest open source RIS 5 cpu uh, so the special thing about it is that it is bit serial so uh, if you look at the diagram on the left side so the conventional cpus perform the parallel operations for example if we want to add two bytes so we have to have uh, eight single bit address as you can see from the uh, left figure but in the bit serial way we can use a single one single bit adder and then add bit by bit and then uh, concatenate the results and hence uh, the surf works in this way and uh, but the overhead is that it uh, it takes almost 32 uh, cycles to complete one instructions instead of a single cycle um uh, so 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 uh, it's it's specialized in the area so uh, so uh, it focuses on the area where uh, where where we are uh, in the deep embedded uh, systems so the serve cpu is uh, managed by the fuse soc package manager package manager allows you to compile build and uh, um, and execute it for different targets for for different simulation targets for different fpga targets and for the open source asic targets in very minimalist and easy way and uh, the service also equipped by the servant soc and uh, this soc allows you to have some peripheral support such as uart and and uh, gpios uh, so uh, and also the uh, serve uh, supports the base instructions which are the basic uh, integer instructions uh, load store arithmetic and logic instructions uh, also it has it has support of multiplication and division extension which which is a RIS-5 uh, ratified extension and after this mentorship it has now support of compressed extension uh, in it so it has also uh, enough privilege RIS-5 privilege architecture support to run the uh, Zephyr or RIS-5 uh, real-time working system now let's talk about the integration of compressed extension into the surf so uh, on the left side of the uh, in the left side of the slide you can see the memory interface of the surf uh, so the surf sends an address to the memory and the strobe bit and in return the memory sends uh, the corresponding data and the acknowledgement um, so what we need to do is uh, for the compressed extension support, we need to first of all have the have the uh, compressed decoder that that decodes the the incoming compressed 16-bit instruction into the into its equivalent uncompressed 32-bit instruction. So uh, so we have to have compressed decoder. Then then we also have to uh, integrate a realigner module because with the support of compressed extensions, there there will be uh, inherent misalignment uh, address misalignment with respect to memory. So so realigner will uh, take care of all, all of that. So uh, also we have to uh, most um, do some tweaks inside the surf uh, to. Um, to generate an address of uh, <clears throat> program counter plus two as well as uh, in, in addition to plus four. And uh, the whole compressed extension support is parameterized uh, and is managed by the fuse as you see as uh, described before. So uh, this is the updated uh, diagram. Um, of the of the serve after the integration of uh, compressed uh, extension support as you can see that uh, uh, the the address and the strobe bit from the serve is managed by the serve aligner and it generates the final address and the strobe bit and in return it gets the instruction the serve aligner gets the instruction and the acknowledgement and uh, if it's an, if, if if it's an compressed uh, instruction, then it will be decoded. Otherwise, it will be just passed uh, to the serve core. So these two most essential modules need to be implemented. Uh, and uh, the most challenging one was the serve aligner uh, realigner module because it was a state machine uh, or digital state machine. Uh, this is the this is the. 
uh, uh, whole whole life of the cycle in of the compressed recorder but uh, i guess i don't need to explain it over here you can you can read it in the final report and uh, get the understanding of it from there and uh, finally uh, when, once we have the support of the compressed uh, extension in the serve then uh, we have to test it whether the uh, whether the compiled instructions are working on the core or or no or not so for that uh, we have the open source is 5 architecture compatibility tests in which we have the compressed extension tests as well so uh, so after the after adding the support uh, 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 the next thing was to run and these tests on the serve and perform the debugging until and unless the whole all the tests of the compressed extension are passing so uh, so these are the 27 uh, compressed extensions uh, and all of them uh, passes the tests and uh, uh, and uh, with and uh, in the uh, serve uh, and we we also run the serve uh, we also run the zephyr uh, is real time operating system with the compressed extension enabled so uh, just make to make sure that uh, the the extension is implemented correctly and uh, and uh, so after the completing the main part of the project, so uh, uh, I we had time to uh, do some uh, additional contributions. So I added board to Nexus F uh, to FPGA board to the Servant SOC, and uh, so and also the uh, fix some bugs for the previous instructions. Uh, as, in the serve and uh, uh, make sure that all the privilege compatibility tests are also passing so these are some uh, additional contributions uh, in addition to the main uh, project and uh, and this is uh, i guess all from from the project side but uh, you can learn more details and the technical aspects and the implementation details of the project in my final report uh, which is available on the medium uh, under this link and you can visit the github repository for the surf uh, it's an amazing cpu i have been contributing uh, since uh, after uh, after this mentorship as well and uh, and my contributions to the surf can be followed in the last uh, link um, in in the end if you uh, uh, so i'm i'm interested in the computer architecture digital systems and um, RTL design projects so if you are interested or or you can collaborate if you want to collaborate with some open source project then do re reach out to me through email or linkedin and um, i would like to thank to my uh, mentor so uh, my uh, let's talk about my experience i have a really great, great experience uh, so uh, it was my first open source experience i have not uh, I really contributed before this mentorship and uh, this was this was my first uh, like intro introduction to the uh, to the open source and I have been contributing since uh, then and uh, my mentor and I have uh, the mentor mentee relationship uh, not for uh, restricted to only that uh, uh, mentorship but uh, we have a long on relationship and we sometimes talk about uh, ideas and projects after after the mentorship after that mentorship as well i would like to thank um, links the links foundation who has offered um, uh, this project uh, who has list, uh, who has such a great platform uh, for, for the new uh, contributors to come and uh, uh, show their capabilities and that is five international for uh, offering this uh, amazing project so uh, this is all about and uh, my advice uh, for the future uh, and uh, this was my first experience and after that i have been contributed to the uh, google summer of code 22 program as well and uh, and, and contributing on my own uh, uh, open source project as well my advice to the uh, future mentees is that if you find some uh, some program like lfx or google summer of code or some similar funding program and if you want to get enrolled and you and uh, so the best thing you can do is write a good proposal and list down the things that you need to implement once you write it down and um, 
uh, once you uh, once you list it down list down the steps then you are more confident uh, that uh, uh, in your skin that if uh, that uh, if if you would be able to do this or you need some more research and work or some more homework to do before uh, apply to this applying to this project so that was all from my side thank you very much Thanks everybody um, for presenting. Um, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. It's been uh, um, great to listen to all of you talk about what you learned. And this concludes our um, mentorship showcase for this year. Um, we will do one more next year. Thanks everybody. Bye.